We've been studying these uh, eight verses in the Shikarini meter at the end of cantos 14, 15 and 16 in Asvagosa's Saundarananda. So they're, they're the culmination of the, the Buddha's teaching. Uh, Canto 14 is, is the theme of it is seclusion, practicing in seclusion. Good conduct practiced in seclusion. Canto 15 is titled Abandoning Ideas. And uh, Canto 16 is the Buddha's elucidation of the Four Noble Truths. So Canto 16 is the longest and the most important, we could say. So there are three verses in Shikarini Mita at the end of Canto 14, two at the end of Canto 15 with the gold mining metaphor, then three verses at the end of Canto 16, and then the addition of an even longer meter, Shikarini Mita is 17 syllables. Then the end of Canto 16, we've got this verse in Ati Driti Mita with 19 syllables. And uh, as we examined yesterday, the, the final padder of, of that final verse of Canto 16 has a very <clears throat> simple and memorable conclusion. Tadviryam kuru shantaye vinyatam viryehi sarvardaya. So make an effort in the direction of softening. For in effort, assuredly, lies all growth. So that, that conclusion kind of alerts us, I think, so when we when we review all the verses in Shikarini Meter with that in mind, two themes that run through them are softening from the verbal root sham. Sham, shanti, means peace or softening. The softened condition. Uh, it's from the verbal root sham, which the, the gold mining metaphor is all about the importance of, of, of a shamayati, causing everything to melt away, causing the mind to melt, causing ideas to melt away. So uh, sham has got a lot of meanings and uh, they're, they're worth, all of them are worth considering. And then the final word of, the, of Canto 16 is <clears throat> Sarvardaya, all kinds of growth. That's from the verbal root Vridi. Uh, sometimes it appears in Vridi, which means growth. So Vridi or Vridi mean growth. <clears throat> Uh, so let's let's review. Let's see let's see what happens. I don't, I'm not sure if we get through all, all the verses, but we'll start with 1450. Kvachid bukdva yat tad vasanamapi yat tad parihito. Vasan atma rama kvachana vijane yo piramati kritarta sajneya shamasuka rasajna kritamati paresham sam sargam pariharati ya Kantakamiva. One who eats anything at any place and wears any clothes, who dwells in enjoyment of his self and loves to be anywhere without people, he is to be known as a success, a knower of the taste of peace and ease, whose mind is made up. He avoids involvement with others like a thorn. So the, 
Krita Mati means that the mind is made, Krita made, composed. <clears throat> so that expresses a certain determination. So that we're talking about, we're going to talk about peace as a, a softened condition. But also running through it, we could say, is, is the importance of virya, which means it's cognate with virility. So there is that kind of paradox there. His mind is made up, kritamati. But the resolve to avoid involvement with others, paresham samsargam, involvement with others. Ironically, in, in a deeper meaning, what this is suggesting is the teaching of prapanchopashamam, which means uh, the cessation of othering or the cessation of objectification. Upashama, prapancha plus upashama is uh, prapanch opashamam, which Nagarjuna says in the dedicatory verses of MMK. That's basically what the Buddha taught, prapanchopashama. So it means the cessation of othering, stopping othering, not othering, uh, not objectifying things, not not turning what's happening into uh, into objects to be gained. So if you wanted to corrupt the Buddhism, and I think that's precisely what uh, stooges of the British establishment like D.T. Suzuki, for example, wanted to do, you, you would say like the, the object of Buddhism is all about enlightenment. That's the aim. And, you know, if people aren't enlightened, then forget about it. Essentially, that's what's prompted me to start this series of talks, which was in response to a friend who had kind of expressed his kind of disillusionment, oh, nobody's enlightened, what's the point, kind of thing. Now, the Buddha's teaching is a religion of practice. It's not, it's not a religion of achieving ends. Uh, I'm ref I reflect on that as I, as I get ready to, you know, I've been looking forward to, to doing this tour and now, now this morning, I, I slept well last night, so I think, yes, now, now is the time to do my little performance. But no, that's, that's not what it's about. A better approach is to think, well, look, here's another chance to practice reciting the verses. You've made a mess of it so far on nearly every occasion. It doesn't matter. Keep What I want to encourage people to do who are watching the video is to practice it for themselves. You don't need... Uh, somebody who's objectifying, embodying enlightenment uh, to, to give you a good example. But you do, you do need, you do need uh, friends in practice. Like in Sound Rana, there's one verse that says, going along with friends in the good. You know, we, all, we all need our friends in practice. We don't necessarily need uh, the person we think we need who's the embodiment or objectification of the truth because <clears throat> that very idea might be just the kind of idea that should be abandoned or caused to melt away. See, we, our mind becomes hard. In certain circumstances, our mind becomes hard. And what the Buddha is describing in these verses really is the opposite situation where in favourable circumstances the mind becomes soft. So in this verse, the word soft is in shama. Shama sukha rasa jna. A knower of the taste, rasa, of ease, sukha, and shama, peace. But with peace with a connotation of softening. So the softening is there right from the beginning. One who eats anything at any place and wears any clothes. So this is the old Zen phrase, not picking and choosing, isn't it? It's, it's like when our mind is set, it's fixed on something, 
it becomes hard, it becomes fixed and rigid. So uh, the whole idea of the unsui, the, the clouds and water, the name for a, a wandering monk in China, unsui, the clouds and water, is a, a person who, whose mind doesn't need to be fixed on any particular thing. As a wandering mendicant, you know, whatever village you, you, you pitch up at, uh, you know, you can, uh, the food will be provided by supporters. And if not, well, you go hungry. It's that kind of whatever happens, whatever happens, well, let's see what happens. Whatever happens is okay. And so that's really, if we could live like that, it would be the antidote to the society where we've got a clock in from nine to five and the surveillance society where, you know, more and more everything's regulated uh, from the top down, you know. If we lived our lives just as individuals in, in a more kind of let's see what happens kind of way and rejected rejected the uh, the stuff that makes our minds hard, you know. So many young people suffering from anxiety. And that's 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 why, you know. That's why they're not in, people's young people. The growth of young people is not being encouraged. In fact, quite the opposite. You can see where the whole business of net zero, human beings are bad for the planet. You know, this whole this whole thing is really to stop us growing. I could go on, but let's stick to the positive. Okay, who dwells in enjoyment of his self. So, again, it's not that the mind becomes hard by seeking to get one's hands to achieve some external object. No, he's describing someone who just enjoys his own self, which is not the same as being selfish, because the self is empty. It's like Marjorie Barlow used to, uh, said to me 25 years ago, because she could see the tendency in me to be like the Buddhist missionary tendency, the zealous, the zealous, the zealous missionary tendency. She said, listen, if you want others to be happy, you have to be happy in yourself. Then it will spread out as if in ripples. That's why, that's why I look for this place in France, somewhere I could be happy and let happiness spread out in ripples. That was a very explicit idea I had at that time. One who dwells in enjoyment of his self and loves to be anywhere without people. So this isn't because we hate people. It's because when, when, we're, when we place the body in seclusion, that's another verse in, in, in this canto. Yoga nu lo mam vijanam vishabdam shayasanam Tata Saumya Bajasva. So, my friend, repair, repair to a place uh, suited to yoga, without people, without noise. A place for sitting and lying down, or Shaya lying down. A place for lying down and sitting, asana. Kayasya Kritavahi Vivekamadao. For by establishing seclusion of the body first, sukadigantum manaso viveka. It's easy to obtain seclusion of the mind. So that's what we want. We want we want a seclusion of the mind. That's why we love to be anywhere without people. Not because we hate people, but we, because we love seclusion of the mind. Where we Seclusion of the mind will we'll come to in the gold mining metaphor, where the mind is separated from harm, like gold, particles of gold being separated from... Uh, from dirt, gradually using water.
so he avoids uh, he avoids involvement with others like a thorn. This relates to growth because prapancho 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 the softening of prapancha, the suffering of other uh, othering, the melting away of othering. That's that's really what we're growing towards. So this, even this verse below the surface, has got those two themes of softening and growth. And the next verse continues in the same same theme. Yadi dvandvarami. Jagati Vishaya Vyagrahardaye Vivikte Nirdvandvo Viharati Krati Shanta Hurdaya Tata Pitva Prajna Rasamamritavat Tripta Hurdayo Vivikta samsaktam vishayakripanam sho chati jagat. If in a world that delights in duality and is at heart distracted by objects, he roves in seclusion, free of duality. A man of action, his heart softened. Then he drinks the essence of wisdom as if it were the deathless nectar, and his heart is filled. Separately, he sorrows for the clinging, object needy world. So, that, that, this, this verse kind of just confirms more explicitly what, what was implicit in the previous verse. A world that delights in duality, so that's the duality of subject and object. In that world, our, our heart is distracted, at heart we're distracted by objects. We're distracted to the core by objects like the, the object that distracts Nanda particularly in his struggles in, in Sandra Nanda is his wife Sundari the beautiful Sundari the object of his sensual desire so in this not this canto, I think the previous canto, the Buddha explains to Nanda that objects, we shouldn't blame objects as the cause of our suffering. A fire of affliction arises when uh, we see an object as existing and then we have parikalpa imaginings, illusions about that object. That's how the fire of affliction like like uh, obsessive love, for example. That's how it happens. That's how that affliction arises. By objectifying some object and then having imaginings about the object. And the alternative that the Buddha recommends to Nanda is seeing things as happening. Bhutata. So before I studied MMK, the teaching of emptiness at Nagarjuna's clarification of bhavana as letting it happen and equally in light of that study of the Rahula Sutta before that I thought the Buddha's words yata bhuta mean as it is see it as it is that, that's how it's usually translated sometimes it's translated accurately which is better yata bhuta but to see it accurately means to see it as happening 
That's the, that's the secret. When we see everything as happening, then there's nothing, there's no object to cling to. There's no object to home in on, which makes the mind hard. So it's the teaching of emptiness which really, in that sense, helps us grow. That's why in MMK, Nagarjuna says that uh, without, without understanding the ultimate truth of emptiness, Nirvana is not attained. We don't let go. We cling to specific objects. We, 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 uh, we get stuck on particular issues rather than letting everything melt away, causing everything to melt away. And uh, understanding the meaning of prapanch, prapanch opashama, the cessation of othering, the melting away, the melting away of objectification. That's what these verses are really about. So if he, he rose in seclusion, free of duality, a man of action, kriti, it's from the verbal root, kri, like karma, like the, the, the goldsmith is called, the karmara, the, the worker, the gold worker. So kriti, a man of action, his mind is softer. So we've got together Kriti Shanta Hurdaya. So I translated before his his heart at peace. So Shanta is the past participle of Sham. So it, ostensibly it means his heart is pacified, his heart is calmed, he's at peace. But a, a more practical translation, probably in light of the gold mining metaphor, is his heart is softened. So instead of rigidly pursuing this and that in the world, this and that object in the world that delights in duality, he's just enjoying himself, roving in seclusion, in separateness, free of duality. Then he drinks the essence of wisdom. Prajna rasam, prajna wisdom, understanding. We're talking about understanding emptiness, really. Softening and growth, which are the two themes that emerge. They emerge in light of emptiness. So, <clears throat> the way I'm understanding these verses now, is very different from when Asphagorsa's Gold was first published like 15 years ago, before I studied emptiness uh, in, in Nagarjuna's teaching. He's studying emptiness and also it's, it's practicing Zazen in a different way. When you understand the teaching of Zazen is Bhavana, and Bhavana means letting letting happen it's a very non-doing in, in that light our approach becomes softer less doing because <clears throat> in light of emptiness there's nothing there's no limited objective nothing is limited there's nothing to hone in on see that's the that's the irony in in, in this talk of Vivikte in seclusion. It's a, it's a paradox of when the mind is in seclusion, separated off from end gaining, separate separated off from duality. Uh, then then uh, it becomes clearer. It can it can become clearer that we don't want to see see things in isolation. Separately he sorrows, separately vivikta he sorrows, shochati, for the clinging samsaktam, object needy, vishaya kripanam, 
the object needy world. Vishaya Kripanam Jagat, the world. So he's, he's describing how we don't want to be, you see, in terms of the clinging to objects. So the thing that the thing to be softened is is the mind that clings to objects. We can say that mind is to be softened, or in light of the gold mining metaphor, which we're coming to. Shamayati, shamayati mana, the mind that's caused to be melted away. So vishodya kleshebya, shamayati mana. The mind to be cleansed from afflictions, he causes to melt away. So it includes softening, but it also includes this, the idea, it's abandoning ideas. We soften the mind, and at the same time, the mind that wants to get something, it's not only softened, but it, it, it's caused to drop off caused to run out of energy. That's another meaning of shamayati. Caused to <clears throat> cause to cease. And let go of it completely. And so the final verse of Canto 14. Again it's not obvious on the surface but in light of emptiness this verse is all about emptiness. Vasan shunyagari yadi satatam e ko biramate yadi klesh otpadai sahana ramate shatrubir iva charan atma ramo Yadi chapi bati pri ti shalilam. Tato bung te shreshtam. Tridasha pati rajad api sukam. If abiding in an empty place, he loves ever to be one. If he fools around with arising of afflictions, no more than he fools with enemies. And if, going around enjoying his own self, he drinks the water of grace, then the facility he enjoys is greater than the sovereignty of Indra over the thirty others. So shunyagari, an empty place. Ostensibly it means a deserted place, a place where there's no other people about. But of course really what he's doing here is, is flagging our, the importance of the teaching of emptiness. Because eko, one. Abhiramate, enjoys. So he enjoys ego being one so that means being an individual but an individual living in seclusion but more than that it means it means uh, letting the separation between subject and object melt away, causing to melt away the separation between self and others. So it's ironic, isn't it? We, we, we live in seclusion, separating ourselves from others in order to enjoy the melting away of separation between self and others. Think that covers those three verses. 
in the spirit of practice I'll, I'll recite them again from memory as I've been doing every, every morning recently and enjoying enjoying it a lot uh, so I'll do the two verses in the gold mining metaphor <clears throat> and uh, the verses at the end of Canto 16 I'll do those in separate talks thing is to enjoy practice not being in a hurry enlightenment can wait as bodhisattvas we shouldn't be interested in, in our own enlightenment anyway encouraging others in their practice is more important and practicing practicing memorizing and reciting these verses is a practice I would certainly recommend it, in gold mining metaphor we'll come we'll we have the word avartayati uh, which means he, he collects the gold he melts the gold and uh, turns it over he turns it over and, and the turning over the gold is a, a metaphor for collecting the mind but this sense of you keep coming back to the same old thing. For me, I come back every morning to the eight truths of a great person. And I come back, I come back to Alexander Directions. Sending the knees forwards and away. Head forward and up from there. From there we want it. Knees forwards and away. Pulling to the elbows. Widening across the upper part of the arms as you widen the back. Let the head forward and up from there. Let it happen. Letting it happen. To cut a course through tough terrain. Rain flows away. Then comes again. It's like the gold, the gold mine, you see. He keeps turning the gold over. In the same way we, we keep persisting. We, with a softened mind. Now I'm getting ahead to the the metaphor of of the, the rivers that cut through a mountain. See the the rivers of the water of a river is soft, melt water coming down from the Himalayan mountain. The, the ice has melted, the water is soft, but it flows swiftly and constantly, swiftly and constantly, and then then it it can melt even a granite mountain cut through a granite mountain so that's that's how we practice keep right on keep practicing when you're tired and weary still journey on till you come to your happy abode <clears throat> speaking of which it will be it will be eight years this summer where my old best friend's son only son George Grant uh, passed away I think it was June of uh, June of 2016 so uh, I dedicate I'll dedicate these three verses to George Grant's memory here we go then see if I can remember them Kvachid Bukdva Yatad Vasana Mapi Yat Tat Parihito Vasana Marami Kvachana Vijani Yo Biramati Kritarta Sajnea Shamasuka Rasajna Kritamati Parisham Samsargam Pariharati Ya 
Kantakami wa. Yadi dvandvarame jagati vishaya vyagra hrdaye. Vivikte nirda dvandvo. Viharati kurti shanta hrdaya. Tato pitva prajna rasamamritavat tripta hrdayo. Vivikta sam saktam vishayakripanam shochati jagat. Vasan shunyagari yadi satatam e ko piramate. Yadi klesh otpadai sahana ramate shatrubiriva. Charan atma ramo yadi chapi bati priti shalilam tato bung te shrestam tridasha pati raja dapisukam.